joined Sam and Ross from the Nottingham Building Society as they catch up on the Money Pot podcast with Director of Hockey Guy Doucette and Media Manager Dan Kerry to talk all things hockey, savings habits and New Year's resolutions. Find out how they and the players have coped with lockdown, what they've been doing to keep busy on and off the ice, why Guy returned to the Panthers and what Paws has been up to in his spare time. Listen to the full episode on the Nottingham podcast, The Money Pot. Check it out today. Okay, we're back with a brand new episode of the Nottingham Panthers audio experience and I'm delighted to welcome former netminder and current future super agent, Nick Riopel to the show. Nick, how are you? Really good, Dan. Thank you very much for inviting me. And then, like I, like I mentioned to you a second ago, where I like to really start on this show is like all the way at the beginning. We like to get people to know the people who we talk to. So if you just give me a brief overview of where hockey came into your life. Well, uh, like most of North American uh, player, I started really young playing hockey at the age of four. And then actually I started to be a forward because as all the young players, I wanted to score goals. And then as I get older, I, I like scoring goals, but I still wanted to defend. So I went defenseman. And one year, I think I was uh, 10 years old. Uh, every time my goalie got scored on, he was crying and... Uh, the last game of the season, I told I told him, hey, next year, I'll put the pads and I'll make the team uh, instead of you. And actually, that's what uh, happened. And my dad was a goalie. He wasn't too fan about it because, you know, as you learn along the way, goalies, it's, it's, it can be uh, tough at times because it's, it's always you're either a hero or a zero. So, uh, but I took the challenge. I had really a uh, lot of fun and I actually was, was good at it. So along the way, I uh, always uh, did uh, the, the best level possible every year uh, I had. I was drafted in the QMJHL, which is a major junior in, uh, in Canada in the first round, first goalie being drafted. And then uh, I was, uh, uh, had a really good uh, three or four years in, with the Mountain Wildcats. Um, and was you know drafted in the NHL by the Philadelphia Flyers in uh, 09 and actually the draft was uh, in Montreal that year so was able to invite all of my family member we were almost uh, over 50 in the stands uh, waiting for my name to be uh, uh, announced so it was a special moment today um, and then uh, I played the pro I did three years with the uh, Flyers farm team and the, uh, the year of the initial lockout, I received a call from a guy called uh, Jeff Hutchins uh, from the Dendy Stars. And he told me a great thing about uh, Scotland, uh, the, the, the UK. And uh, I think it was a great... Uh, also, I wanted to live uh, the, the family um, experience. I, I had a girlfriend at the time who's now my wife. And she had a five-year-old daughter who's now just turned uh, 15, 10 years uh, already. Um, and I really wanted to uh, uh, experience the uh, family living. And funny story about um, about Jeff uh, is that my biggest concern was I want to play as many games as possible. He said, "Well, you're going to play them all." I said, "What? Uh, play them all? How many games are a season? Like 20?" Or he said, "No, 56." I said, "56 games." He said, "Well, because the backup here." It's just if you're either not healthy to play or if you play a really bad game. I said, well, okay. I, I think, though, that it changed over the years. Uh, you know, number two goalies, especially the, the Brits, have been, uh, been uh, much better uh, the past uh, few years. So it's, it's, really, it's good to see. But at that time, when you go back uh, 10, uh, 10 years ago, uh, it was just a hey, number one is an import and you, you go from there. So... I went there, I had a really good season, second uh, team all-star, went to uh, Denmark, uh, which uh, whereas my, my daughter was born in Denmark. So really good experience there. And we finally uh, ended up in France with a one where we are the, the French uh, championship there. Uh, and then my, you know, my wife said, hey, Nick, how come you don't go back uh, to North America to try to live your dream, you know, because I was looking at uh, goalies that I played with or against in my time in junior that were making their debut at the NHL level. And it was always a, a concern of myself. Say, hey, I trained uh, so hard. I, I made all those sacrifices, but here I am, uh, 25 years old, uh, uh, three years in Europe. 
you know, I, I think I wanted to jump back. So I made the jump back, started the ECHL, and then I uh, received a call from Julian Breesbra, the GM, general manager of the Tampa Bay Lightning, uh, wanted to offer me a minor league deal. So I took it, and the following two years, I've been with the organization. And then my last year of uh, playing a career, at 28 years old, I had a, the best uh, training camp uh, I could imagine. And Steve Eiserman, also who was the uh, director of hockey operation, announced me that I would play my uh, first NHL game, uh, actually against uh, Carolina. So that's where I have by those uh, two jerseys uh, in my office here, just to remind myself uh, that, uh, you know, all my sacrifices uh, was worth it. So, and then at, uh, that was my playing career. And at the same time I was in Dundee, I actually received a call uh, uh, from a lawyer who was passionate about hockey, who's now my, my uh, partner and my best friend and just wanted to know if I would be interested in the agency business. And I have run plenty of uh, hockey school uh, here in Montreal, Quebec, and it actually helped a lot of uh, kids being drafted in the QMJHL. I, was, I played there for five years. Uh, I was MVP, I broke some records. So, you know, it was just natural to me. And I was I've been always passionate about the, outside world of a hockey player, you know, like uh, nutrition, training, psychologists. Uh, so uh, I, and I just started like that and actually did, did the uh, representation. Mean, uh, meanwhile, uh, still playing hockey at the professional level. Like I had some NHL uh, training camp, had some minor league uh, contract. I actually sent a few guys uh, in Europe, including in the, in the UK, where, which I'm sure you're going to mention uh, later on. So. And here we come three years later uh, after my retirement, uh, uh, doing pretty well and really happy about uh, the accomplishment uh, I've done so far. And if we look back at your time on, on the, in the EIHL as a player, your year in Dundee, how much did you know about the league going into that? Uh, to be honest, I didn't know much. Uh, and I think it's like that with most of uh, North American players playing in the AHL East Coast just because you're so focused about making it to the NHL that you don't really see the options uh, overseas. So I didn't know much. The only thing I knew, to be honest with you, Dan, is that we were driving the opposite way, you know? <laughs> That's pretty much uh, what I knew about the, about the UK. So, uh, but, and it was just, it was just a good learning experience. Uh, Jeff Hutchin was outstanding to me and my family. The Wards family were outstanding, and they, I know they, they are still are uh, to this day to the, the players and their family. So, no, it was uh, just great. And actually, during that time, if I do remember right, there's a few NHLers that came to the UK during that lockout here, which made the league really, really strong. Uh, and no, I really enjoyed my time there. And then obviously, this, this is a, a Panthers related show. So, I do have to mention that that year you were in Dundee was probably one of the best, the Panthers put together one of the best teams the Elite League's ever seen. What do you remember playing against that Panthers team with the likes of Bruce Graham, David Ling on that? Yeah, well, I remember, you know, the, the first game of the season we played in Dundee, we were playing against Coventry, but I don't know Coventry. And I think we lost in a shootout. So all the fans, all the city was buzzing just because we were losing in a shootout, so I, but I didn't understand why because technically, you know, all of those, um, uh, you know, English team are a little bit much better than, than the, the Scottish team, but I didn't know at that time. So uh, everyone was just happy to get at least a point. So when we, I think it was the second week of the second weekend of the, uh, the, the, the season, uh, we drive down to Nottingham. And when I put my, uh, my foot on the, in the rink, I was like, oh my God, what an outstanding setup. I didn't know it was, uh, was possible here. And Jeff says, well, wait at game time. It's going to be uh, pretty crowded. And I think I remember like having eight, 9,000 people in the stands. It was just outstanding. And what I liked most about the UK and even my wife still um, uh, tell me those story is that the fans, we can hear them. As a player, you can't even hear yourself uh, talking with the eyes, and that's what makes uh, the experience uh, even better. 
So when I played against Nottingham, actually, I knew one player uh, in Nottingham. Uh, it was uh, Bruce Graham, if uh, I'm not mistaken, because he played for the Mountain Wildcats in the past. Uh, he was from there, so we kind of knew each other a little bit. But I remember that uh, David Ling uh, was there. You guys were outstanding. Uh, it was uh, it was always a challenge. I think you know the first period it was okay. It was one or two nothing, but the shots were like 20, 25 to uh, four, something like that. And uh, we we weren't strong enough uh, in the need that year to uh, keep up with the pace uh, until the, the end of the game. And, but I remember watching a lot of games from, let's say, the Panthers against uh, Sheffield, Panthers against uh, Belfast. It was, it was, I think, to the another level of the, the league. Do you remember what David Ling did in that game, your first game down in Nottingham? When he... I think he slashed me right in the face. That sounds about right, but he also drank out of your water bottle. Uh, well, I think because, you know... <laughs> I was frustrated. Of course, he slashed you in the face. Well, it's David Ling. <laughs> yeah. Well, the funny thing is that uh, he uh, he sent me a message a few months ago on, on LinkedIn, and you know, where we have a, a good relationship. But for me, to be honest, I didn't know who David Ling was. So when I see him in my in the front of my crease, and, and you know, poked me up a few times here and there, I said, "Who's this guy?" So I start slashing him, you know, uh, behind the legs and all that stuff, and then. He looked at me really calm and slashed me right in the face. And then I took my bottle and tried to uh, spray him with my, my water. But it was like my third or fourth game in the league. I said, oh, my God, I'm here for a uh, for run here. So. Um, obviously, the, the, those games are special when you come into Nottingham, Sheffield, Belfast, those big arenas. But the rivalries up in Scotland are, are, are intense, aren't they? Especially when like, Dundee play five. You go into that building in Kirkcaldy. It's a different world in there. Oh, it's outstanding. Like, uh, first, it's, it's really cold, not only for the fans, like, it's cold for the, the players, the, the, the locker room, my so, uh, uh, so tight. And what's funny, like, not that bad for a goalie, but I remember talking with a few of my teammates, he says, look, the, um, the boards and the glass are so low that even at the face of I receive uh, something behind my head, you know, at the face of that, just because the, the, the fans in Fife are so intense and they, they love their team. And, uh, and I knew it was a big rivalry. Even when we were playing in Dundee, the game was set up to be at seven, but they wanted to wait as long as possible to pack the, the building uh, so we can have a team. Some, sometime we, we had to wait uh, 45 uh, minutes uh, after the warm-up just because uh, a lot of people were, uh, were coming in. So those were a really, really big rivalry. And I think over the years, uh, you know, in the past also, uh, Edinburgh was a big uh, rivalry uh, as well. And uh, Brayhead, who's now Glasgow. So no, I think, uh, but Fife and then the, uh, I believe, for it's a little bit like uh, Nottingham and Sheffield. And when you go to a place like Dundee, like you mentioned earlier, you're not expected to win when you go there. What does that do to you as a netminder? Because when you're playing every game and you're not winning all the time, does it affect you, your confidence, or are you able to deal with that pretty easily? I think the way the schedule is set up with two games, most likely on Saturday and Sunday, it's either you're going to spend a great week or a bad week. Because if you play a really good Saturday and Sunday and you get two or three or four points out of four, well, you feel good. You, you, you feel that the fans, even yourself, you get five days to think about it. Uh, practice feels good. Uh, and, you know, you, you feel the city buzzing. But on the opposite, if you play two games and you play bad the first one and you lose the second one, well, you think about it, and it's not the best feeling uh, to, uh, to deal with for the next uh, four or five days. So I think it's, it's, it's a good, and it, there is good and bad. Uh, but for me, what I like is I knew that I could give it my 100% those two games, and I could get, you know, three or four days of rest uh, before my, my other one. So I think, I think it's perfectly set up. Uh, for a number one goalie to play as many games as possible. Then if you compare with a few other uh, European leagues where most likely it's uh, Tuesday, Friday, Sunday, and it keeps going uh, like this on and on, 
which at the end of the day, it can with traveling and stuff, it can be challenging uh, for your body as a goalie. Well, then obviously you're facing incredible amounts of shots every night, playing over 50 odd games. You still manage to maintain a, an above 900% save percentage. You, were you one of those guys that, that really enjoyed facing a lot of shots? I think it puts you in the game, but at the end of the day, like you're not asking your teammates to uh, get the other team uh, 40 to 50 shots. I think it's just the way uh, it is. And, you know, with referees, uh, also it can uh, change the momentum of the games. And Especially in Scotland. Well, I'll try to be as polite as possible. So, uh, you know, sometimes you can get... Uh, you know, a good game after two periods can be, you know, 20, 22 shots, but it's good. And then get three or four calls to potentially get the, the game even or depending where you are. Anyway, so, uh, but I just, yeah, yeah, for a goalie and for myself, I always try to go one pair at a time, one game at a time, one shot at a time. So, and we'll see the end result at the end. But, you know, uh, I know for a goalie, when you, f you feel good in your net uh, and you know that you've let either zero, one or two goals after two periods and you receive uh, almost close to 30 shots, well, you don't mind if you get uh, 10 or 15, you feel good about it. And then one of your teammates in Dundee that you'll be of particular interest to Panthers fans is Sammy Rianen, who played for the Panthers in 2011-12, I think. What are your memories of Sammy? Because I've heard he's quite a character. Well, I think Sammy was always good to me, to be honest. Like, yeah, even after uh, two, three years after, uh, he went back in Finland with his family and he played there and he kept in, con in contact. And uh, even when I tried to uh, uh, start up to be uh, an agent, I wanted to do a few contacts in Finland and he always uh, helped me out. So I think Sammy was our go to guy uh, offensively. So there was a lot of pressure on himself. but. He just wanted to have fun. So pressure for him wasn't too, uh, uh, didn't affect him too much, uh, but we expected so much of him that I think it was either you, you liked him or you hated him because sometimes, some nights he could get you uh, two goals and two assists and the other nights could get you a, a ghost a game being a minus three, you know? So you had to, to deal with it and, but for most, uh, most of the, the season, uh, uh, we were rewarded with his effort. If you had to look back at your time as a player in the Elite League, what would your m most favourite memory be from that? I think my, uh, as a player, uh, I think not as a person, but as a player, was we had a three-game weekend. Uh, we started in, in Belfast, uh, and we've won the game and we i know one or two uh bus fans uh, was following us and they were all staying in the hotel after so when we won against belfast and their building it was just outstanding everybody at the hotels at the bars uh, it was a great moment my family uh, drive up uh, as well with uh, kelly the, our daughter and the following day we had to go to uh, brayhead and we go there and the fans were still there and we've won the second game there. And we finish it up in Edinburgh and we won it like 3-2 with something like 25 seconds left uh, in the third period. Uh, Sammy actually, I think, scored a goal. So, you know, we could hear uh, the fans chanting like six-point weekend, six-point weekend. So for us, it was uh, our, the, the moment of the, the season, uh, I think. And on a personal fan, to be honest with you, Dan, and I think it was one of the best experience I lived in my professional career was the people in Dundee, the, the fans of the, the, the stars were outstanding. The fans of other teams were outstanding when my family uh, joined the, the fan bus and we were going no matter like Nottingham and Belfast and uh, five, they were always taking care of and being part of family. And even to this day, my daughter is 15 years old and she still remembers. And when we have family dinners, my wife's talk about our experience in Europe. And that's the first thing uh, she says that how great it feels to be part of the, uh, you know, the UK community. And uh, we have uh, 
a special place in our hearts for, for them. And as you mentioned, like you were a, a second, an all-star in the, in the Elite League and you really caught the eye wherever you went. Was there never an opportunity for you to come back and play for another team in the Elite League? Well, to be honest, uh, we uh, Jeff and I, uh, after a season, had a really good discussion. Uh, he wanted to uh, actually offer me a, a long-term deal. Uh, my family felt good. The only thing is that as a pro athlete, I was really young. I was 20, 24, and a lot of people were asking me at 23 when I started the season, what are you doing this here? Like you're 23 normally. Uh, players coming here more late in their career. But I think for me, it was just an opportunity to have a chance to play, chance to prove to, to myself and to a lot of people in Europe I could, I could play in a better league. So I think it was just a stepping stone for me. And I just told Jeff, hey, I, I might regret it not to take it, but I might regret it also not to see what else, uh, you know, in, in Europe. So... And actually, two months later, I received an offer in Denmark, which I feel at the time was a, a step for me. Uh, the healthcare was outstanding, which is a big uh, point also uh, with my wife being pregnant, giving birth to Chloe there. Uh, and during you know the three or four years following the, my UK season, uh, the Elite League, I received a few offers here and there, you know, uh, Glasgow and Coventry and. So, uh, but I think for me, it was just in the past and I wanted to, uh, after France, just because of the language barrier was a great, a great experience, more money, you know, uh, how it is. And then going back to uh, North America, closer to family, friend, grandparents, trying to achieve my goal to uh, uh, touch the initial once again and uh, 28 just to, to, to decided to retire and then and move on. Then, even though you like you said you were just 23 when you were in Dundee, you still brought a, a really good winner's mentality to that room because obviously you'd won the QMJHL championship. You won the you, you won the playoffs over there. Do, do you think that helped you cut, like like we mentioned, well, cope with not winning all the time? Yeah, but uh, I think the before we were winning the QMJHL uh, championship, um, we were you know in a really really bad uh, situation. Uh, with the organization when I started there at 16 years old we were the Memorial Cup host so then the following year well a lot of trades a lot of uh, veteran uh, were moving to pros so at 17 years old actually we didn't make the playoff uh, so it was was hard uh, hard to learn it was supposed to be drafted second round in the NHL uh, had like uh, 20 interviews with the NHL didn't get drafted because I had a bad uh, uh, bad end of the season and 18 we didn't make the playoff as well and 19 I had my my really my best year uh, uh, in my career winning MVP uh, first uh, you know CHL Canada All Star so so I think it it learned learn how to uh, to win but how to deal also with um, with Dundee but you know we've lost in the last weekend in Dundee not to make the playoff. So we played two games against uh, Edinburgh and on a Saturday we had to win. We were winning 2-1 with 10 minutes left and they scored two goals right away and we, we saw our chances uh, went away in the last game of the season. I gave it to uh, my good friend uh, Mark McGill because uh, I know he was in his hometown and he, he was such a great guy and he still is uh, to this day. So I wanted to give that uh, opportunity to him. So. And going back to your time in the in the QMJHL, when you win the Memorial Cup, that the, the team you were on at Moncton wasn't it isn't full of people who have gone on to like it's not full of tons of NHL superstars. There are a couple of really good players like David Savard, who's gone and played a lot of NHL, Mark Barberio, who played a lot for Tampa Bay and things. What did you learn from from that campaign at such a young age to go through that and win the Memorial Cup? You know, like I was, I was uh, 20 years old uh, when we won the President's Cup because the Memorial Cup is the, the CHL and we, uh, we didn't win the, this one. Oh. But the President's Cup was really special because after I was 19 years old, I was drafted with a, with a flyer. I signed a minor league uh, pro deal and I moved on to the AHL. And then at Christmas time, there's a few injuries here and there. They make a deal to uh, bring... Uh, Michael uh, Layton in with the Flyers and they just decided that it was best for me 
and my development to go back as an overager in 20 years old and finish a season with the, the Wildcats. So we made a lot of trades. We traded for uh, Nicola Deschamps, who played a few games with the Washington Capitals. Uh, we traded for Gabriel Bork, who played for Colorado Avalanche. Uh, you know, we, uh, we brought a few, uh, few guys in. We already had uh, uh, David Savard, who I was with uh, the past two years. He's a great guy. Uh, he played Columbus. Uh, Mario Barberio, uh, who we traded uh, the year before. Uh, from Cape Breton, who played uh, with the Avalanche, with Montreal Canadiens. And we had uh, Brendan Gormley, who played for uh, Arizona Coyotes uh, a little bit. And a lot of guys also played at the AHL or, you know, uh, Merrick Rivick, who played with the uh, New York Rangers, uh, Kelsey Tacey, who played a lot of years uh, in the uh, DL and Afghanistan in Switzerland uh, in uh, Sweden. So, you know, we had a really, really strong team and we actually beat a lot of good teams uh, to be able to, to win that, you know, just at the finals in St. John, Jonathan Huberto, who played uh, um, with, the Fly, uh, with the Florida Panthers. Um, we had uh, the also, who's the forward, uh, Mike Hoffman, uh, who played uh, in the NHL. So, you know, it was a hard challenge, but it was the best moment of my playing career just because to win the championship and the way it was to end my last game in major junior in front of my family, in front of my, the, the fans, uh, to, you know, to wear the last time the Jersey and actually, uh, get the chance to win the championship was, was an outstanding feeling. And one of your fellow netminders on that team is currently playing in the elite series, Shane yeah. Owen. Yeah, well, Shane Owen. Is that strange to see a guy who you play with at junior still playing whilst you're retired? Well, it's not a surprise that he's doing so uh, so well because I remember uh, Shane was actually was he signed with the Wildcats while I was still pro, and then when I uh, got sent down, they traded another goalie uh, in Quebec, who's actually Louis Domingue, who's uh, playing with uh, today in the uh, Calgary Flames uh, farm, uh, organization. And I remember Shane, outstanding person, very funny. Uh, everyone liked to be with him, around him. Uh, played great uh, when uh, he had the chance to play. He knew his role at the time. Uh, he knew I was kind of the number one and he had to, to take a step back, but never complain. Always good to me, always cheer me on. Uh, we had a really good relationship and even to this day, uh, the, in the past few years, you know, he asked for my help to uh, to find him some organization. I tried uh, tried my best, but when he signed to the, the UK is, is the first time, uh, I wasn't surprised at all of, of his success. And I knew he was a great competitor. Uh, he likes to win. He's, you know, his compete level is, is really good. Uh, got a good hockey sense, a great guy. So, and he liked, he liked beers. So it's perfect for the UK. Perfect for the UK. I love it. <laughs> and like you mentioned, after after all, all that you went to Europe, you went back to America to chase your dreams playing in the NHL. What was it like when you finally got that moment? What what when you when you achieved that? Is that a, a sense of a comp? Was that a sense of you know I've done it now? I've done what I wanted to do in the game. Yeah, exactly. Like when I uh, decided, well, well, when we decided as a family to go back in North America, uh, we had to sacrifice. A lot of things. Uh, one, uh, you know, when you go back in North America, the minor leagues level, uh, there is no guarantee. Uh, your contract, you can be released uh, at any time. So being in charge of my wife, who was a nurse at the time, who decided to leave her job to follow, you know, follow me, follow my dream, uh, to have, uh, you know, two kids now to take care of, a baby, a uh, little one who has to... Uh, do a homeschooling or long distance with, uh, with our school. It wasn't uh, too, uh, too easy. So I, we went all in. And at that time also, I decided to represent myself because I started uh, the past few years to uh, you know, be in the ind industry. And, but most of my contacts were in Europe, but I knew a few in the uh, American League level. So I started signing an ECHL deal, which is the third level in uh, North America. And I had a great first half of the season. So at Christmas time, I decided to, and we were really tight uh, because I had to deal with family. 
uh, and pay for a lot of, of things and the apartment issues. Like we've signed for a really low salary. So at Christmas, I decided to communicate with all 30 teams at the HL level and just telling them, hey, I'm back. I know I've been away for three years, but I feel like my game is improving right now. And I'm, I'm 26, I'm ready to, uh, to take another step. And two, three weeks later, uh, I received a call from Julian Brisbois, who's another French Canadian in the NHL. And he says, hey, Nick, uh, we, uh, we noticed you. We noticed that you've been doing uh, pretty good at the East Coast level. So we want to offer you a HL level until the end of the season. And let's see what the future holds for next season. So for me, then, it was a big, big moment. First, I was to the next level. I've signed, you know, I went from France to the second best level in North America. And on salary wise, it was four times what I was making uh, at these shows. So it was, it was big, uh, really good. And then during the summer, they decided to re-sign me to another year and to invite me at the, their NHL camp. So I did that. I had an okay uh, NHL camp. I wasn't outstanding, but just to see uh, at that time, Ben Bishop, Vasilevsky, uh, you know, Stamkos, Enman, uh, it's, it's, you know, Kucherov, it's, it's pretty uh, surprising. I was, and my last NHL camp was with the Islanders, uh, you know, maybe six years back. So it, it, was, it was a while. So I had a really good season at East Coast, did some uh, good job at uh, HL level. So the following year, Julian Brisbois kind of challenged me. He says, hey, Nick, what's your dream? What's your goal? I said, it's to play in the HL. I said, well, get in shape and... If you play better than uh, Ben Bishop, we'll give you a chance. So, you know, the challenge was, uh, was up there. So I trained hard, paid myself a nutritionist and make sure I was doing all the right things. And come at training camp, really focused. I had my best training camp ever. And then two weeks after, we had the rookie camp, we got the normal camp, the main camp. And after the, um, the main camp, after one week of the main camp, it's all the AHL players who are sending down to potentially the AHL uh, training camp started. And I see a lot of people going out of the office with a paper saying, hey, you need to report in Syracuse on Sunday, blah, 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 blah. So I'm just thinking I would go, go there and they would tell me to go uh, to Syracuse. And actually uh, Steve Eiserman looked at me and says, Nick, to be honest, we're really impressed with you. Uh, you've been doing better. Like he says, right now, we can tell you that you are our number three goalies at training camp. So at first I said, okay, so what does it mean? He said, we will keep you for one extra week and we'll send Michael Layton, who signed as the third goalie, to uh, Syracuse. So for the, and you're going to play the first uh, game, exhibition game against Carolina. So for me, like, and it was my first time then, even with the NAD, with the Flyers, I never had a chance to even dress up to NHL games. So, you know, it was a big moment. Uh, you know, I go out to the office, I call my wife, my parents, just in tears, thinking I would play uh, for the Lightning in Tampa Bay with the fans. And so it was great emotion for me. And, uh, and that's, how, uh, that's how it happened. So it was, it was really, really nice. Obviously, you've played against a lot of great players and things. How different is it facing a shot from like a Steven Stamkos to someone else? I imagine it's a different world. It's a, it's a different world, but you know what? They are the same than all of the guys uh, we meet uh, either in the Elite League or... No, they're just young hockey players having fun. It's amazing, you know, like... Uh, uh, when we go to the breakfast, it's like a buffet, you know, like you get a chef uh, asking you what do you want to eat and you can mix, what do you want to? And you got uh, Tyler Johnson who comes in, you know, with his flip-flops, uh, low maintenance, just goes in and says, well, I'll take uh, three pancakes with bacon, please. You know, and you would, and he comes in an hour later in practice and works his, bag off and competes and but and he's just having fun and Steven Sampo's just after practice doing some shootouts uh, contests uh, against me and uh, 
Victor Henman wanted me to stay in the net because he wanted to practice his one timer on the five on three. That one was pretty scary. But uh, no, all, all in all, it was just, it's the biggest difference for me uh, when you go up as the level. It's when it's time to have fun, you get fun. But when it's time to business, it's business. And that's for an hour and 15, an hour and a half, when the guys are practicing, it's like passes are tape on, the, on the tape. They don't miss a lot of shots on, on net. They stop in front of the net. Uh, they are here for a rebound. They compete against each other. They are physical in the corner. Like there's, there, there's no easy way. It's either a hard or a go home. So. And then you retired quite early. I think a lot of people were surprised when you announced your retirement. You were still putting up good numbers when you were playing. Why did you retire at the age you did? Um, there's a few things uh, that led to that decision. Uh, when I, you know, was still on HL contract with uh, with, Sir, what, with Syracuse, who's Temple Bay's farm team, and the farm team was actually in uh, Adirondack, who's only three hours driving distance from where I live in Montreal. So my wife decided that year to uh, stay home with the kids just because uh, the, old, the oldest, you know, she did the, the UK uh, in English, Denmark and Danish school, France and France school, and then uh, uh, with uh, in the US, uh, English school again. So it was a lot of moving and she, she was in grade five at that time, it was really important for her. Uh, with a really important year. Uh, so we decided it was best for her to stay, have some moments also with uh, her dad uh, that she haven't pretty much, uh, didn't see much for uh, four or five years. Um, and my wife could deal with her business home and we had a daycare for Chloe. So the setup was just perfect for me on every days after just maybe just do a back and forth. Huh? But in February, Julian Breezebrook called me says, Nick, we sorry, sorry to tell you that, but we, we trade you. We trade you to uh, uh, Edmonton's farm team uh, against for Nerd Goalie with more experience. But Edmonton really wanted to include you in the deal. So I said, okay, and where is the farm team? He says, it's in Wichita in Texas, like uh, middle of the US. I said, oh my God. So my wife was too, not too happy uh, about, about that decision uh, right now. And she just say, hey, Nick, like you're 20 weight, we're 20 weight. How do you evaluate your chance to make it to the NHL? Uh, your business in the agency is, is doing good. Um, you know, like I've been living in the apartment for the last 10 years. I would like to buy ourselves a house. Uh, the youngest will start school next year. The oldest is going to be in grade six next year. Like, is what do you think? So we kind of, I kind of realized, hey, look, I know what you want to say. Uh, I think I'm going to be ready. Please let me finish the season and enjoy until the end. So I said, okay, that's we're going to make that deal. So five, uh, we, I go to Wichita and five days, uh, five games before the end of the season, it was hot. Uh, the weather down there is, was, uh, uh, well, it was good when you were off the ice, but on the ice, it was uh, so humid. It was hot and hard to deal with. And I always lost as a goalie and even my time in Delhi, I lost a lot of weight. Uh, normally, I was losing in games between 8 and 12 pounds of water. Oh, wow. <laughs> so every game. So I could start the weekend on 185 and can end it up at 168 you know so it was hard for me and my body but when you're young you don't notice uh, too much but when you get older at now 28 and i was clearly the number one goalie there and what's different in north america there's a lot of traveling especially in, in, uh, in that league uh, there's a lot of games three games and three nights four games and five nights uh, so and we had a team, a good team, but who led a lot of shots uh, as well. So was hard to, uh, to deal with. So uh, I would say by the end of the season, started to feel some fatigue, uh, some cramp. I was uh, uh, 
uh, dizziness, uh, vomiting a little bit after games. And my wife, being a former nurse, hey, it's not normal. Like, uh, go, uh, you know, go get a checkup or go at the hospital. But I'm, I'm scared or afraid of uh, needles. Mm. Okay. So I said, well, I don't know. I'm good. I don't want to go to the hospital. I'm good. So one or two weeks passed by. And then we play four games in five nights. And first game, I felt good. Second game. But the third game at home, and what I think the uh, there was two left games left at home, uh, so before the season ends, so you no know, 12, 15 uh, fans in the stands. The building was was so hot, and I was losing a lot of weight. And after the second period, going the net, it was kind of a two-two games, and I was starting to cramp everywhere: uh, my calf, uh, my hips, uh, my arms. Uh, everywhere and in the middle of the turn i just i almost passed out so i decided to rush in the locker room and actually i just i couldn't move and i was moving maybe eight to twelve times uh, uh, and i rushed to the hospital and after spending two days there the doctor said look nick we did some scan um, and we see that your one of your kidney is really in bad shape uh, and we, uh, we found some blood in your urine. Uh, so, you know, uh, I said, okay, so what do you say? He says, it, it can not happen again, but it can happen also. But if it happens again, you might need a new kidney. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. He says, look, Nick, I don't know you much, but if you were my son, I would still strongly recommend that you stop. So by that time, then I called my wife, and it was uh, it was over. So uh, and but I just had the chance with the remainder of the season. I think it was five game left in the playoff to be kind of the assistant coach and be with the guys until the end. And when I came back, I felt good about myself. I felt good about my career, and I didn't want to be in a situation where I had a hard time playing with my daughters. Uh, uh, just because I wanted to still push it for an extra uh, five, four games. So that's how I ended up. So it, it made the decision easier for you, sort of thing, based on the conversation you had before. So, which is not a nice thing, but it's nice that, you, that it, it, it helped you make the decision. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it wasn't made, it wasn't a decision, you know, against my my grade, but you know, it was a decision. I think it was the perfect setup. I was uh, was twenty nine. My favorite number is twenty nine. Uh, you know, my we bought a house. Uh, my both my kids were going to uh, to starting school. My business was doing good. I was still passionate about the game, so I think all in all, it couldn't uh, fit any better. And, and does that does being still being involved in the game help you scratch that itch to help you not miss it as much, sort of thing? Yeah, I think that uh, there's a, there's a reason why a lot of uh, players when they retire, if they're either a coach. Because you want to be as close as possible as the normal routine that you, you, you've known for the past 15, 20 years. Uh, and what I, I enjoy the most is to call the, the guys and see how they do and watch their game and know how they feel. What I miss the most is when I take my, my keys and go drive to the rink and see all the boys and talk and, you know, enjoy all the victory. And when you get together and on the road trips, and that's what I, I miss the most because now most of my days I, I spend in, I spend it by myself or over the phone with either a team's a coach uh, uh, or player, you know, or my partner. So it's, it's a little bit different, but I kind of get that same uh, vibe when I, go watch uh, hockey games and meet with the GMs, uh, parents. Uh, so, but yeah, that's, I think it made the transition a little bit uh, smoother. And you, then you, like you say, you go full time into the, the, the sports agency world with, with hockey. And that can be quite a cutthroat world from everything that you hear about. It. How have you found being an agent? Has it been all roses for you? Have there been challenges? What's it been like with that side of things? Well, I think uh, this year was pretty, uh, pretty big of a challenge, I can tell you that. But uh, no, I think uh, I always pride myself on keeping a good relationship 
uh, everywhere uh, I go. Uh, and I think it helped me uh, reconnect with a lot of people in the uh, hockey uh, community, either in North America and Europe. Um, and I believe that when I made a transition, I knew a lot of people, but people knew that as a player, I had a really good work ethic. Uh, I was smart, was involved in the community. Uh, you know, I was a really good team player. So I think I wanted to also represent a player that reflect uh, my, uh, my, my own person. Uh, so it created a really good relationship and uh, a lot of trust. Uh, but the biggest challenge was to, you know, when you start in the agency business, the outside world thinks that an agent first is millionaire uh, and he's, uh, you know, only uh, drive, uh, you know, moving by plane and it's just, uh, you know, the, the, the luxurious uh, lifestyle, which is, is not at all, is not a lot of this, uh, you know, a lot of hours, a lot of grind, uh, a lot of consistency, uh, a lot of network and it's, it's who you know, but it's how you can sell one of your player and one, once your player do good, well, you, you just create a really good real relationship, but one, one of your player is not achieving the expectation, well, it's how you're going to rebuild the trust with the GM. So I think it's uh, the biggest thing. And you, you've, you mentioned uh, also, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of competition and there's some big, big, big agencies that it's hard to, uh, you know, it's the first two questions I've, I've been asked a lot of by parents when I, I try to uh, get a prospect, it's how many players do you have in EHL? You know, like that's the first question because it impressed the, the player, but impress also the parents. Uh, so, and that's one of the most uh, question. And the, how long have you been doing this? So when you say, well, one or two or three years, it's, uh, it can be always challenging compared to uh, uh, agency who have been doing this for 20, 25, 30 years. So, but I think I found some, some few things that can differentiate uh, my, myself from others. And I found some things that players like in the, the new worlds of the millennials with the 2020, 2021, uh, you know, with social media, with, uh, with a lot of stuff, with recognition, with proximity, with, uh, uh, so I always tell, we can either be, you know, a fish, in the ocean or it can be a, a shark in the pond so as a player you need to decide where you want to go and also you've got some really nice clients on your books like some that are very familiar to the elite league like anthony beauregard currently lighting it up in the echl yeah. you sent a player to the panthers last year and it was a bit of a unique situation in alexis loazo yeah and we never got to see the best of alexis he got injured very early on when he was out here. What do you do in that situation when a player gets hurt and has to retire because of the injury he got? Well, I think uh, Alexi was a, a special a special case. He was, Alexi likes to be at the same place, uh, like, and he refuses a lot of AHL call up just because he was good, you know, he liked his family's uh, situation with his wife, with his dog, and now he's uh, expecting a baby. Uh, but, you know, he moved to North America, he moved to uh, uh, Germany and then uh, signed into uh, Denmark, signed into Slovakia, uh, but played in Hungary, then in Nottingham. And, and I think it was also uh, time for him and his wife, who they've been almost uh, 10 years together, to say, hey, where do we want to go as a family? Do we want to uh, start a family with a baby and uh, set up uh, here in Montreal? Uh, well in, in Quebec uh, so I think there was a lot of question and when he had and he liked everything about Nottingham you know like the, the fans and uh, how great he was taken care of and Deuce uh, did a really good job uh, with him uh, as well but when he had his concussion it was just hard because he's trained so hard all summer long to get ready for a new season and then you put yourself on pause for two three weeks you have to redo it again and then you feel some few headaches, you need to pause again for two, three uh, weeks and then redo it again. So I think it was even harder for him to try to go back on being as the best shape possible than just 
be in a normal season where you practice, uh, you rest, you play, and uh, you keep rolling. So I think it was just the best situation. And he didn't feel that he could live up to the best Alexi Loazo that he could. So with that in taking in consideration, he just decided to say, Nick, I think it was just best for me, for my family, but also in respect for the Panthers to just take a step back. And he was ready to leave the money aside. It's not a money situation. He wanted to start, uh, go back in school, wanted to be involved with Rimouski Oceanic, where is uh, his QMJHL uh, team where he won a championship there. Uh, his wife is from there. So that's where to, that's where uh, it leads uh, to uh, Alexis' decision to retire. And then he got to go and coach Alexis Lafreniere as well. So not a bad, not a bad end to this last season. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So no, he's, uh, he's enjoying himself. He's in a good place. And like I said, he's after retiring. You, uh, he wanted to be as close as possible uh, from the ice. And he's actually touching the ice every day because on practice and he could help uh, younger players achieve their dream. And you've got two players in the that I know of in the elite series as we speak, in Jeremy Boudreau, who unfortunately you sent to Sheffield and seems like a pretty good player. And then Dominic Talbot-Tassi, who I've had a couple of conversations with and what a great kid with, with just such great passion and energy. Yeah. What drew you to Dominic as a, as a client? <laughs> well, Dominic, uh, I know Dom for, uh, for a lot of years. Uh, actually, well, Dom was pretty much one of the, my first, uh, our first client in propulsion. Uh, when I started that uh, five years ago, um, you know, he was uh, 19 at the time, moving to his overage, overage year. And I just remembering uh, calling him to see what uh, his expectations were and where he wanted to, to go because I could maybe, you know, help him because my partner was uh, working for a team in, uh, in West Canada in junior A and could make, a, you know, a good season there. And so, and, you know, we, we got in contact and he had no way, no presentation. And actually one of his best friends uh, was uh, Alex Dubo, uh, who is now playing in South Carolina in the East Coast. Uh, and Alex was a goalie and he wanted kind of a mentor. So that's where we kind of took the challenge and Dominic uh, played, was playing for uh, uh, Armada de blainville Boberia, uh, is his hometown. But Alex's best friend was playing for Moncton, which was my, my former team. So I made kind of a deal where I trade, I decided to help Dominic to be traded to Moncton where they can finish their overage a year together. And then we found him a, a, a school a package with McGill, uh, which is uh, pretty much the, the best school you can, you can find uh, in North America so far. So, and Dominic did a really good job for four or five years uh, there, uh, outstanding numbers. And I think this year was just challenging also for Dominic decided where where he wants to go, he had a lot of offer in the ECHL level, but it's it's not something that was uh, attractive for him. Uh, his uh, his girlfriend found a job, and we know with the pandemic, it was really challenging for the families to to follow the players, and you know, uh, so he, I think he did a, a master as, as well with uh, with his uh, just decided to make a master, and when the uh, the elite uh, series came up and say, hey, you know, like uh, I'll contact him and see if he would be interested and actually say, hey, Nick, you know, uh, why not? I told him, look, um, I think it w you would be really doing really good there. Yeah, the ice surface is perfect for your style of play. It's mostly North American style uh, compared to other leagues in Europe. So it's not going to be a, a big uh, learning curve for you. Uh, and it's one month, and I think you can either show your potential to Nottingham, to the Elite League, or also to Europe. So I just think okay, you're, you're winning all the way. So I said, perfect, Nick, uh, I'll, I'll think about it. And two hours later, he calls me and says, okay, I talk about it, and let's go. So, and then I got in contact with, uh, with Deuce, and uh, uh, I told him that... Uh, Miguel student were the best uh, ever. So uh, 
he said, okay, I'll offer you a contract. And that's, uh, it was pretty easy. <laughs> you knew who you were selling to then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I took him by the emotion. Uh, speaking of Guy Doucet, what, what's he like around the negotiating table? He's, he's a great guy. Uh, you know, outside of his role as the, the, the director of hockey, he, he's just a great person. Uh, uh, every, everyone you, you talk to about, about Deuce, he's the same with everyone. He's a great guy. He knows, uh, he knows his hockey. He knows the leagues. He knows what, what kind of player he wants. He's really specific about what he wants. Um, and he's always looking to improve down the road in the future and if it could be a good fit for you know three four years he's not a lot he's from my from my field he's not a guy who uh, likes to uh, re-sign uh, 14 imports uh, every summer you know he would like to build kind of a, a championship uh, legacy for four or five years uh, a little bit like uh, cardiff did uh, the, the past uh, few years so i think that's what uh, his plan is, and uh, he felt that with Dominic, it was just a good opportunity for for him as a GM to give a French Canadian slash McGill student a, a chance, an opportunity. And we've always had a good relationship, so he knows he knows that the player I, I sent, like uh, you get what uh, I'm, I'm telling you, you know. So I'm not trying to. Uh, uh, over bullshit you about uh, how outstanding the player is, and but I'm telling you uh, the truth. I'm really honest, and uh, that's where our, our relationship uh, is from, and our, uh, our our trust is from as well. So uh, I, you know, and for the negotiation, then you know how the salary works. So it's either plan A or plan B. And so there, there's not uh, too many, uh, too much negotiation, uh, and with uh, everyone staying at the hotel, so. Uh, there's not much to negotiate uh, for the Elite Series. And then hopefully, like, like I always said before we started, with the world slowly going back to normal, you know, there's fans back in stands in North America now. It's The roadmap over here is, is the same. It's slowly coming back and stuff. You must be looking forward to getting back to more normal conversations for you. <laughs> well, yes, because uh, this year was uh, challenging uh, for, well, everyone, I'm, I'm sure, but for an uh, agency business, it was a little bit uh, more challenging on my side, just because, well, first, like, we've, I've never, we've never seen uh, this happen uh, in our lives. And second, it was just challenging with, um, are you going to have a league? Are you going to start or no? Uh, uh, you know, so the border situation with the Canadian, the American, and uh, is the, the, girlfriend slash wife fiance can come dog uh, no so it was just challenging all around with the nhl starting later with guys wanting to sign uh, even for peanuts uh, with the nhl uh, loaning their prospect taking over 160 uh, spots in, in europe so uh, it was challenging but yes uh, i'm I'm really looking forward for some sense of normality, uh, but we almost go day by day, week by week, month by month. Like uh, for here, I don't know how it is in, in the UK, but here in, in Canada, like my goal was just to say, hey, my, my daughter will be set to go back in normal school on September with, well, with all the variants, with what's happening, the vaccination being not as, as fast as, as, as we, we thought, well, is it still going to be in the same spot? Is it still going to be the challenge? So, uh, yes, I'm looking forward, but I don't know how much of a normality we will see uh, this summer. And if you had to pick one, the biggest thing you've learned because of this pandemic as an agent, what would the biggest lesson you've learned be? So I imagine that could be a tough question, but you've been, you've been through something that, not a lot of other people have. <laughs> um, the learn, I think it's uh, what I've learned is that I need to tell players what's the reality is and their their wife, and that sometimes money it's good, but 
the priority should be go in a good place, in a good organization where you know you will get every penny of your paycheck and where you will go to your apartment and you will feel good about going to your apartment and that your wife will be happy to take a walk in the in the downtown and that she will feel safe. So, you know, that's where I tell the, the players, like, because the first question I ask the players, like, what's your, your goal next year? Well, as much money, uh, money as, as possible. I'll say, well, yes, but, you know, would you take less to go in more secure spot uh, and with all the budget going down 15, uh, 20% uh, this summer with, you know, a few teams decided not to take North American and sticking with only uh, EU uh, passport player was just uh, challenging. But I think my the most learning curve was to create a relationship, but to make sure that, you know, I was sending a player where I would feel comfortable personally going with, with my family for, for a six uh, to eight, nine months uh, period. Yeah, but one of the really cool things about proportion that I really like is like a, a media marketing type person is that you're very active on social media, bigging up your players, putting the spotlight back on them. Was that a conscious decision you made when you started that was something you were going to do? Well, I think, uh, you know, in the past when I was really young prospect, um, I had two big agents uh, in, uh, in North America. And I think I took some some good things I wanted, I would like to keep and some things that I was not a fan of. Uh, so for me, I needed to find some stuff that was, was really unique for propulsion. And I think that proximity uh, being really there, being really close with the player, uh, make sure, make sure you, uh, uh, you know, you're there at every question, every time of the day, uh, feel really close either when they have a good, bad game, not only calling them uh, once or twice a, a year and, you know, hey, what's your email? I'm going to send you the invoice uh, bill. You know, like it's uh, that's not the relationship I wanted. Uh, and the second thing, it was accessibility, you know, uh, answering to uh, the, the text messages. And right now with social media, then it's impossible not to be able to answer. It's it's a it's a lack of uh, professionalism. It's a, it's a, you know, it's, it just, it's not, doesn't have its place. So with, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, text messages, uh, Messenger, uh, Facebook, it's, you know, WhatsApp, there's a, there's a way. So for me, it was just important to be really uh, accessible. So give me a call. If I'm not answering, it's either I'm in my shower or uh, I'm sleeping. That's pretty much uh, when I, I'm not going to be able to answer. So, uh, but that's where uh, we wanted to, to go. And with that, the social media, I think, was really key because no matter what the job, people would die for recognition. Uh, so you see the best uh, industry or the best companies outside of hockey, People want to uh, work for the company. They feel uh, they feel like part of the family. Uh, they feel important, and that's why I want to feel. And for me, with social media, everyone, well, most of the, the players are, are there. Most not of the coaches, most of the GMs, the scouts, uh, the owners. So that's how they see how many players. Uh, how, you know, I don't have to reach out to. You know, 50 of the GMs to tell them, hey, my player is doing very good. No, they can see it uh, on my social uh, social media. And also, it brings the attention to other players that maybe don't have that same attention uh, with their agency or they see that, you know, hey, this guy has been signing uh, five or six players in the past uh, two weeks. So how come uh, I don't even get a response from my, my, uh, my agent? Or let's say I'm calling... Uh, Last year, uh, Anthony Beauregard, uh, on, when he was on the road, or when he was uh, eating uh, at the restaurant with his, uh, with his teammates, uh, hey, who it was? Oh, it was my agent just calling me, see how I was doing. And oh, how come my agent doesn't call me that often? How come 
And I think it brought a lot of, uh, we call it locker room talk. Because at some point during the season, and do some sure could tell you that, you will talk about how much you make salary-wise. How come you get that kind of bonus? I don't. Uh, how come my, the, the flights of my wife is not being paid and you, you uh, is? So it's, uh, that's, you know, I think that's how it makes our success uh, so far. And then, firstly, I can't thank you enough for your time today. I've kept you much longer than I said I would originally, but this has been fascinating. But I do need one more story out of you because I have one steadfast rule on this show and it has to end on a laugh. So I need a story from your career, whether it's when you were playing or since you've become an agent, that makes you smile. Hmm. It's always good to put people on the spot for that one. <laughs> makes me smile. Well... You know, like, it's a funny story because I, I'm sure you guys remember A.J. McLean. Yep. So, and A.J. McLean, at some point, and I didn't expect that at all, he came in on, a, on a, I think it was a morning skate or the day after a game, and he says, uh, hey, Nick, are you ready to uh, meet me somewhere uh, downtown, you know, or just to catch up or eat and so, well, yeah, I said, well, wait for me, you know, like at, at that street in the corner. So I said, perfect. And I turn around and I see AJ McKean running with the Scottish uh, shirt, you know. So uh, it was was so funny because he, and I told him, it says, well, uh, you know, do you have something underneath your skirt or you have uh, nothing? He said, well, do you want to find out? I said, no, 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 I, I don't want that. You can, you can leave it to you. So he said, okay, so let's go to the restaurant. I said, what? You're going to go like this? I said, well, we're in Scotland, buddy. So it was just a funny thing to, you know, to remember again, uh, AJ McClink running towards me with his, uh, his kilt. green skin. <laughs> his kilt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that's brilliant. I, don't, I, don't think, I can't thank you enough for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, break from teaching, yeah. uh, from your homeschooling and, and things like that. It's been, it's been wonderful to hear your stories and have you on the show. So thank you so much for your time, Nick. Thanks for the invitation, Dan. Appreciate it. And, you know, thanks for the, the pencils for taking care of them, uh, uh, Nick Talbotessi, like they do. Join Sam and Ross from the Nottingham Building Society as they catch up on the Money Pot podcast with Director of Hockey Guy Doucette and Media Manager Dan Kerry to talk all things hockey, savings habits and New Year's resolutions. Find out how they and the players have coped with lockdown, what they've been doing to keep busy on and off the ice, why Guy returned to the Panthers and what Paws has been up to in his spare time. Listen to the full episode on the Nottingham podcast, The Money Pot. Check it out today.